What we've seen is a huge focus on credit for years, and there was a vocal minority, but minority, that were very interested in savings and microinsurance, and that minority has gotten bigger and arguably is the majority now. And it's not that people are saying only do savings, but I think there's just simply a recognition that, that there's not one answer to any one person at any um, for their entire life, and that there's differences across people for what they need, and there's differences within people over time. And in some sense, it's shockingly simple, the point. It shouldn't be seen as revolutionary, but yet when we look at the actual practices at hand of the microfinance industry, it was almost entirely focused on credit. So it's a really nice change that we're seeing in the industry to recognize that not all people should be getting a loan. For some people, a savings account is actually the best product for them. For others, it's insurance. And for others, it's a combination. A nudge is a, a colloquial term that's been adopted from Cass Sunstein and, and Richard Thaler, two behavioral economists. And the, the idea is very simple in a way. It's saying, how can we give people choices that guide them to the decisions that they themselves say they want to make? So in a way, it's about how to expand choices while at the same time setting those choices up to, to help people make the decisions they want to make. And a, you know, an example of this, for instance, is a commitment savings account. So a commitment savings account is something that some people choose to have, right? They're not forced to have it, so it's an expanded choice that they're given. But ironically, it's an expanded choice which purposefully restricts their future choices. And the idea is that for some people who have temptation problems, or sometimes the issue is about spousal control rather than self-control, but by locking money away from their easy access, then they are more likely to reach their savings goal. And this has been, we've, we've done tests of this, and we've seen other programs that were not done with randomized trials, but done, had, had lots of success in, in scaling up to large numbers. And so very important changes in people's ability, and women's ability in particular, to have more power within the household, for instance. For many years, microcredit was sold actually as almost a panacea against poverty. We talk about credit as a good thing and debt as a bad thing, and you know, it's the same thing. So the, you know, the striking thing is that both the overselling and the underselling were plagued with the same problem. Neither really had strong evidence one way or another. And the same things which lead us to be excited and exuberant about it also led the critics to be overly critical. And it is, it is the false attribution of looking at the change in someone's life over time and assuming that that is causal from access to microcredit. So when they saw that, that there were entrepreneurs that did much, much better, they just assumed that, oh, well, this is probably because of the loan. And likewise, when they saw people have disastrous outcomes in their life, even as bad as suicides, they saw, well, this is, they had a loan. This must be because of the loan. When in fact, in both situations, we have no idea what would have happened had that loan not existed. And that's the key to doing a, a well-done impact study. The power of the randomized trial is about establishing causality, attribution. So we have to remember what it is that we're trying to ask when we ask, what is the impact of something? We don't want to just know how did the lives change of people who were in a program who got access to something. We want to know how it changed compared to how it would have changed had that program not been offered, that credit not been accessed. And that second part is absolutely critical. Now, particularly when we get into the space of credit, it, there's two very easy stories that go right back to the overselling and underselling, which, which make you realize that this, this counterfactual is really important to measure. So in one, on the overselling, we, we often hear that microcredit is being offered to highly spirited, entrepreneurial, inspired people fighting their way out of poverty. Well, these are people that are going to do better over time. That's what we mean by being hardworking. So if we don't figure out what would have happened to them without access to credit, we cannot know whether the successes that they, that they experienced in life were because of the microcredit or because of their underlying spirit. Similarly, go to the downside. Take people who find themselves riddled with debt and doing horrible things to try to get out of debt. Was it the debt that caused them to do badly? Or was the debt like the last gasp of air that they reached out for in, in a moment of, of, of desperation? Whereas without that, maybe many more people would have been worse off and not able to absorb some shocks and some risks that they faced in life. And then all of a sudden, we, we see that the, the people who, who continue to do badly have credit, and then we falsely attribute the, the credit as the causal mechanism to what did badly, what caused them to do badly, and that's that's a horrible conclusion. So in both situations, we have what we refer to as selection bias, and it's wreaking havoc with our ability to say what causes what. And the randomized trial is all about overcoming those problems, and they could be overcoming it both on the good side as well as on the bad side.
Randomized trials should not be done everywhere. One of the most challenging things is to figure out when they should be done and when they should not be done. When is, when is that the right appropriate tool to be using to establish the causality of a particular program? And when is actually a good time to walk away from the impact question and not ask it? And instead ask a question about accountability, ask a question about targeting, and use other tools to answer those questions that are important and useful for an organization or a donor and an investor. There's two main things to remember when we talk about ethics and research and randomized trials in particular. The first is the ethical question, which I don't think is asked enough, which should be asked, is, is it ethical to do the research in the first place? Is it ethical to spend money on the research? And I too often see research being done that is not really satisfactorily answering the question at hand and spending a lot of money to do it. And the question is, should you spend 10% of your budget on that or should you deliver 10% more services? And if you're not correctly answering the question, then maybe you should just deliver more services and implement ideas that do have strong evidence behind them from elsewhere. The ethical question regarding randomized trials that often is or comes up is, how do you deal with the control group in terms of restricting access to a service? And there's two things that, that we usually do, and there's no, there's no one size, one answer to this. This is something we're all very keenly sensitive to, and, 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 and all studies undergo uh, kind of a rigorous ethical review. But there's two things to remember. One is resources are scarce. So in, in just about every situation I've ever been in, there, there's an organization that is delivering services, and their budget is constrained in terms of how many they can reach. They're going to go to 500 villages. They're going to reach 10,000 people. Whatever that answer is, the randomized trial does not restrict that in any way. What it does is it opens up the set of people who are going to get potential access and simply randomizes within that set who is going to get the access and who's not. So in some sense, it actually makes it more ethical in the sense that it makes it more open to a wider number of people and then assigns whoever has access in a random fashion rather than through nepotism or, or some other favoritism. So there's many situations where you see the randomization is not holding back the number of people that get access, and it's actually more ethical and more politically satisfactory. In fact, some situations, the researcher was not the one pushing the randomization. The politicians were the ones pushing for randomization for the sake of transparency.